Well, good morning, brothers and sisters here at Scotch Plain. Good morning also to Woodbridge because they're joining us. We're glad you're a part of this. But we also want to welcome those who are watching online because this is a much larger community. And we're thankful for the technology that has enabled us to be able to contact each other, not only via laptops and different things, but services can be watched around the world. I'm honored to be back. I think more than seven years ago when I came and I only I spoke here at this church, what a privilege it was to share what God is doing. My new role at World Help is church relations. I have served on pastoral staff at McLean Bible Church. Um, we have over 110 nationalities. We have more than 80 plus nationalities here right now. <laughs> we praise God for that. What a joy it's been for me to be part of the local church. So when World Help invited me to come back, it's because they understand what God has done in my life in serving in pastoral role is so that we will be walking alongside of the local church in the stewardship of this ecosystem. So people can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. As we say it here, you were transformed so that we can go out in the world and that encounter with the Son of the living God is to bear fruit. The title of my message is simply living out the word. You see, brothers and sisters, we have often been accused as Christ followers to be hypocrite. Because it's one thing to say that you believe in Jesus Christ until your goose is cooked. What does that look like? It is one thing to say that you believe in Jesus Christ until something in your life is incongruent with that. And so it is an opportunity for us to revisit a very familiar passage. And I ask of you that you allow me the privilege to revisit, even if it's a story that you've heard many a times. Because I know when somebody hears the terms, hey, it's going to be about the parable of the good Samaritan. Yeah, I've heard thousands of passages and messages about that. You miss what God can do. Let me open with a word of prayer. We'll go in. Father, may you quiet spirits. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Allow us to be receptive to the teachings of the Word of God. Let me just be an empty vessel this morning that you will use to speak to your people. And as a result of that, Father, may we walk differently in such a way that when people have an encounter with us, they have met with you. Thank you for Evangel Church. It's a community of faith that exists to make you known both here and across the globe. Thank you for the privilege of serving in your vineyard. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The parable of the Good Samaritan, as I said earlier, is a story many of us have heard before. So I live in Lynchburg, Virginia. In order to come here yesterday, I drove to Roanoke, flew from Roanoke to Atlanta. And then from Atlanta, I come here to Newark. Every time you get on our plane, the entire flight crew, they understand that turbulence is not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. It doesn't matter if you're in business class or you're in, in the toilet seat or in the back seat. None of us know how our story will end. And I know there are people that say, well, I live in a safe neighborhood, praise the Lord, and I drive a safe car, and I watch what I eat, and I eat the salad, and I drink fat-free water, excuse me, I drink water, and I do all of that. Knock on wood, everything has been working fine. But I would like for us, as we listen to the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan, is to understand God is in this business of utilizing every single one of us, that our salvation in Jesus Christ is not just to change our eternal address from eternal hell to eternal heaven. How are we living here on earth? May it be about the totality of this biblical corpus, the 66 books in this Bible. Read it, study it, memorize it, tattoo it, put it on a social media, all of that. But ultimately... Can somebody say they have had an encounter with Christ because of what you've read out of the Bible? 
So let us look at this story now. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26. He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered it correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying... Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. I would like for us to unpack this parable of the Good Samaritan a little bit further. The expert in the law of Moses has done extensive studies. He knows more than 600 plus Mosaic laws. But he came to Jesus to test him. This is to him a joke. It's a debate. But as it is always with God, he takes it as a teaching opportunity. Not only to the expert in the law of Moses, but the people around, which are definitely disciples and other individuals listening into this conversation. He wanted to know what can he do to inherit eternal life. Everybody is thinking about what happens after you die. Hebrews 9.27 said, it is appointed unto man who wants to die. Every single one of us sitting in this sanctuary... We have an expiration date. It is not like you're going to get a letter telling you a couple of weeks enough for you to button up things. So how do you want to go? You want to go to the graduation of the grandkids before life is over? Whether you are a princess or you are a pauper, tomorrow is not guaranteed to every single one of us. It was... August 31st, 1997, Princess Diana flew to Paris. She checked into Ritz-Carlton five-star hotel in Paris, the city of romance. She used her cell phone to call her two sons back in Scotland. The first son, Prince William, picked up the phone to talk to her. He was not on the phone very long. Handed the phone to his baby brother, who was only 12 years old at the time, Prince Harry. Prince Harry on the phone said, Mom, our cousins are here. I got to go play. He was not on the phone too long with Princess Diana. This is Princess Diana, brothers and sisters. As our mothers and sisters always do when you go places, they said, I didn't want to go to sleep. I just wanted to make sure you get there and you call me before I go to sleep. That's what Princess Diana was doing. One month earlier, she had celebrated her 36th birthday. And at the hotel in Paris, when she called her two sons, two hours after that incoming phone call from the capital city of France, Princess Diana was killed in a tunnel in Paris. And the French authority had to call the Buckingham Palace to let them know what had happened to Princess Diana. 
Their father, Prince Charles, who's now King Charles, comes into the room. Boys, I want to talk to you. I just got this unpleasant, tragic news that your mother had been killed in a car accident. Stunned. They just spoke to their mother. September 6th, when the funeral of Princess Diana was happening... Prince Charles, who's now King Charles, Princess Diana, Princess Diana's brother, Prince William, Prince Harry, and then, of course, I think it's uh, Princess, uh, you know, Prince Philip, the father at the time. All of them in not tuxedo, following the funeral procession, just like they did for Queen Elizabeth recently. Prince Harry said this. Had he known that tomorrow was going to change like that, he would have told his cousins, my mother is on a phone. He looked on both sides of the streets in London. People were throwing flowers, wishing them well. Everybody knows who Princess Diana is. How could this happen? Multi-millionaires, celebrities were shocked at that reality. How can that happen? Hebrews 9.27 tells us it is appointed unto men wants to die. You take life for granted, you will be surprised when life happens. So in looking at the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan, we will contrast what Jesus teaches his disciples and how the expert in the law of Moses was behaving. We do not want our people be in those Bible study groups Roots, as we talked about it, just to gain biblical head knowledge, can't wait to go post it on social media to see how many people click like on it. What does that mean to say, I love Jesus, my boss is a Jewish carpenter, all is well, it's about Jesus, when we don't live it out. So when the expert in the law was confronting Jesus to test him, Instead of Jesus giving them another definition to memorize, since he recited Deuteronomy chapter 6, to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And then he said, wait a minute, so who is my neighbor again? If that which we have vertically with our relationship with God does not bleed into our horizontal relationship with others, something is patently wrong with that. So the Lord Jesus Christ didn't give him a definition to memorize like he did with Deuteronomy and Leviticus. He demonstrated it with a story. That there's a man that left Jerusalem on the way to Jericho. He fell on the hands of thieves. The proclivity or the propensity of thieves in their pathology, thieves do not discriminate. A thief will rob his grandmother a thief will steal from his sister. A thief, you and him can start a business. They can embezzle you. Thieves will not hesitate to enter the sanctuary to rob the church of these speakers and sell them. Thieves do not care, just like cancer. Cancer does not send you a letter and say, you know what? Since your uncle is on Social Security, I'm going to skip your house and go over there. Watch St. Jude's commercial on children with cancer. Go to the oncology department of any hospital. You will find people from different walks of life. How much money they have is immaterial. So this guy left Jerusalem, perhaps kissed his family goodbye, making his way to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Got caught by thieves. In the United States, it's estimated that every 16 seconds, something is stolen in our own home, in this country. So thieves have always been busy, and they'll continue to be part of our lives. So is the reality of trials. Three people saw this man who got caught by thieves. The first one was a priest, a man of God. He saw him, he passed by and went on his way. The second was a Levite. This is the assistant to the pastor. He comes to the site where that man was laying on the road. He saw him pass by. Oh, some of you may look at that story and say, well, Jesus told that story 2,000 years ago. Today, truth to be told, you have people in your life. They know you're in trouble. They see you, say, better you than them. And they go on with their story in their lives. 
You know what they said? Knock on wood, everybody is good in my family, praise God. Are you kidding me? The third person that intervened is a Samaritan. Of all people, it's a Samaritan. The Jews and the, and the Samaritans don't even get along. The rejection between them is so bad that in John 4, verse 9, when Jesus Christ was at the water well, the woman at the well, Jesus asked him of water. He's just asking him for water. And she said, why are you asking me of water? Samaritans and Jews do not have any dealings. It never crossed the mind of the Hebrew people. In their discrimination and rejection of the Samaritan. That one day, one of their own could be in trouble. And of all people, it is the Samaritan that is going to summon the courage to say, wait a minute. Not on my watch will this guy. And they know the condition of that guy. They saw him and passed by. Reminding us parents, because we often say, well, my kids are my everything. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to focus on my kids. You live long enough, your children are going to travel away. You're not always going to be there when they're in trouble. And you pray to God, somebody like a Samaritan is going to say, I wonder if his mama knows that he's in trouble. Yeah. Set aside the discrimination. I'm going to do something about it. That's what this man did. The Hebrew people are listening to Jesus telling that story. He didn't have Bible passages to present here. All he saw was somebody in trouble. He got off of his animal, out of the uncomfortable reality. What if some of those thieves were still hiding? They could have gotten him here too. But he knew. How will I live with my conscience? Just go home and eat dinner. Man, things have gotten bad out there. Oh, I'm avoiding this rough community. I mean, we have names to talk about these things to excuse ourselves. Not the Samaritan. He went to the guy who was unrelated to him. Didn't ask him, are you a Baptist? Are you a Methodist? Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? You know, we're only helping our own. It is the surpassing value of this guy on the road. Somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's brother. In trouble, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to do something about it. And so he got off of his animal, took his own personal first aid kit with the oil and wine, the wine to disinfect the wound and then the oil to mollify it because, I mean, this guy sustained so much beating. He didn't just do it and say, you know what, now I'm going to go, you know, I wish you well and get on his own animal and go on. You know what he did? What if that guy was weighing 200 pounds? He picked him up. He's going to be okay. I'll try. Maybe I should get your foot off over the animal, however. But whatever it was, he managed to put that guy on his own animal. Took him to a hotel. He didn't get to the hotel manager and say, well, I'm here to check in. I have this guy. He got caught by thieves. You know how dangerous this place is. This neighborhood is bad. So could you just take care of him? And if he gets better, charge him. Get his family to come and pay for it. Because we don't want to develop dependency, you know. And we make it sound so noble like that. Jesus said that this guy spent the night with the guy unrelated to him, taking care of him, just making sure he's okay. Fever, give me some cold water. I just want to make sure he's going to be okay. And the next day, perhaps the guy was stable enough before he got on the road. He goes to pay the bills, tells the hotel manager, I'm paying for what I did, you know, spending here last night. There's a guy in that room I brought. You saw how he was. Could you please take care of him? Here's some money. But should you incur additional expenses associated with the care of that guy who is unrelated to me anyway? Put it on my account. When I come back, I'll be the one to pay for it. Don't send the bill to his family. I don't know his family. Take care of him. Please. Now the expert in the law of Moses is shocked. How is it that a system has had Bible studies after Bible studies? You can brag about the stories that you memorize from the Bible. And you have no idea 
how that relates to people around you. When he was asked of the three people which one actually showed mercy, he pointed to the fact that the guy who took care of this man, unrelated to him, you never know who you're going to need when you're in trouble. And I know some people say, well, I'll talk a few dollars away. I mean, I got my retirement. You know, I, I make sure and I have this and I have that. Let me tell you something. You've lived long enough, life will arrest you out of your pride. A Samaritan, unrelated to him, summoned the courage to say, not on my watch. Took care of this man. Sent him home to his mom. To his family. That could have been your brother. Could be your father. You see, the lesson D just talked 2,000 years ago not only has international application, but it has intergenerational applications. So we now go to the distinction between how Jesus taught and what this expert in the law of Moses. Matthew 28, a passage that we're very familiar with. It's going to be put on the screen for you. Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he said, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. The authoritative Jesus in this passage in verse 18 is telling us that jurisdictionally, he has authority in heaven and on earth. Paul said this about him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. He said, therefore, God the Father has also highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's on the basis of that authority that Jesus is now giving the instruction of Matthew 28, 19. Go. Therefore, make disciples of all nations. And how are you going to induct these people in my family? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When people give their life to Christ and they're making that public profession of faith that we baptize them in this baptistry. We ask them, have you trusted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? When they say yes... We said, upon your confession of our Lord and Savior Jesus, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. That's how Jesus intended this to be. But then immediately after that, listen to what he says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe. That's where the title of my message comes from. Live out the word. Teach them to observe. Teach them to live out. Teach them to make it a way of life. And it's interesting, he says, teach them to observe, not just some. Because you know how picky we are. We can have it like a menu. It's like a buffet. Well, you know, I, I disagree with prayer. I mean, I just, you know, I sneak in a couple of minutes here, and I'm busy, and I have to go with my life. It's not a buffet. Teach them to observe all that I have commended you. This is an injunction from the judge. When a judge has an injunction from you, you don't obey it, they'll send law enforcement officers to go after you. These guys are not going to come to pay you a visit to lay hands on you, to pray for you. They will come to put the fear of the government in you and you disobeying the laws. We're not making this a legalistic style here, brothers and sisters. Jesus wants his character to be reflected in all his followers. For our good and for his glory. So Matthew 5, 13, he said, you're the salt, you're the light. And then he says something interesting in Matthew 5, 16. He said, let your lights so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. What good works are you doing that reflect the encounter between you and Christ? Everything about you, the resources that you have. It's not just for you. It is so that somebody else will say, do I matter that much to God? For his people, like the Samaritan who has done what he did for me. 
But before he ascended to heaven, Acts 1a says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is to come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Those are the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ before he ascended to heaven. He has entrusted all of us, brothers and sisters. It is not just about the edifice of the evangel church, both here at Scotch Plains or at Woodbridge or people watching this online. When people meet us as a community of faith, May they know they have an encounter with God himself because we say we want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. What does that mean in a mundane of life, in a daily reality of human experiences? I remember watching on Facebook, Pastor Chris, Sister Maria, and the pastoral staff, you had serious flood here in New Jersey. And you know what this church did? Put people in a hotel. You were in people's home, dragging out their furniture that were soaked in water. It's not because we want them to think that we're good and nice people. Jesus has staked a presence of ambassadors here. Your house is in trouble. We are in trouble because we live here. So you funding that you're offering here for this church is to give the agility to this local body of believers to say, not on our watch. We'll pay the hotel bills. We're not going to send it to you. We will help you. What do you need? Jesus taught for action. So in Matthew 25, 35 through 40, he says something quite interesting. He said, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me water. I was sick in the hospital, you came and see me. Yeah, I was a prisoner. I was a foreigner. And then he says, in verse 40 of that Matthew 25, he says, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these among you, you've done it unto me. Everything you do into these riffraffs, you're doing it unto Jesus. It becomes your act of worship to say, Lord, I want to represent you well. Because but God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He who did not spare his own, but give him up for the like of us. There is a cost associated with being a Christ follower. So when Jesus said, go and do likewise, here's what it means. Taking into account the fact that that could have been you in the hands of those thieves, go and do likewise. Taking into account the fact that that could have been your son, what would you want somebody to do before they get to you? You may insist, that, well, you know, we just live in a safe area where we don't have to worry about that. Keep on living. Just like I told you, flood got into our homes right here. Safe, but water got into the basement. Such is life. It can change on a dime. There's a British preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He said something that is quite interesting. He said, if you give the man the gospel, wrap it in a sandwich. And if you give a man a sandwich, wrap it in a gospel. What he meant was, you want to give a gospel to the homeless, wrap it in a sandwich. Conversely, if you're having people at your house, let everything about your life be about making Christ known. Let them see that you belong to Jesus Christ. So that you're not just bragging, about, well, you know, I particularly like hosting people and I'm a nice person. That's not what this is supposed to be about. Right. We want Christ to be honored in all our experiences. So compassion is costly. It is inconvenient. It is disruptive. It's not just to be for our loved one. The go and do likewise is, the, Jesus could have said, go and do likewise just with your own loved one. Praise God. He left it open because he wants you and I to feel the weight of that message. I have this big picture of love, God, and people. When the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching his disciples this prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you and I love Jesus Christ vertically, it has to bleed into a horizontal relationship with others. So to love God is to equally be about loving people. Yes, I know they don't look right. I know the things that they're doing. Jesus on the cross of Calvary with nails on his hands. In Luke 23, 34, he says, Father, forgive them for they now know we're doing it. If it were me, I said, Father, fry them. They know exactly <laughs> what they're doing. So pray for me. Has the Lord work on me. But isn't that like Jesus Christ teaching us the way to live to represent him? In John 13, he washes the feet of all 12 disciples, including Judas. The encounter Judas was stealing money out of Jesus' ministry. Isn't that something? He washes the feet of Jesus, all those disciples, and he gets to Judas.
he washes his feet as well. If it were me, I would have done something to his legs. He wasn't going to get up of that Bible study meeting to go collect the money that he sold me with. But Jesus said something very interesting in John 13, 15. He said, I have given you an example. Talking to Peter. He said, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus, I've given you an example. And you know when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's talking to us as well. So I, have, I have given you an example. And here's what he says in John 13, 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Taking into account the fact that I know Judas was up to no good. He sold me. Go and do likewise. It will arrest pride for people to say, I matter that much to God. For them to demonstrate that kind of teachings from the word of God. The word of God requires that we live it out. So as Jesus was concluding the Sermon on the Mount, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my, my Father in heaven. Many people will say to me, Daddy, I cast out demons in your name. I prophesy in your name. I've done many wonders in your name. And then he speak those stunning words. But I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You preached about it, but the practice of your life is nothing compared to those teachings of the word of God. The map that is going to be put on the screen here is that of where I'm originally from. Many of you may have heard of where I'm originally from, but it's Central African Republic, former French colony. It's about the size of Texas. Africa has 50 indep 54 independent countries, 1.2 billion people. The size of the African continent is from Washington, D.C. to Seattle, Washington. Flip it three times. That's how big that continent is. We need the gospel as well. The next picture is that of William Huss. He was born in Menden, Michigan. He was a pastor and had two daughters, his first wife, Alta. At the time, he was preaching the gospel in a local church. But the Lord was basically stirring his heart to go make Christ known, that which is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He refused to go to Africa. You know what he said? It's not safe over there. Unfortunately, two of his daughters died here in Michigan. His wife died. He resigned from the pastoral ministry in Michigan, came to Ohio. In Elyria, Ohio, First Baptist Church of Elyria, Ohio, he went there, and they started an organization that is the missions agency that brought the gospel to my country. He found a second wife, Genevieve, and they got married. She said, wherever the Lord sent me, I'll go. Initially, those words of William Haas, which was, Lord, any land but Africa, I'll go anywhere but there, when his family died, he all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, even here in the United States, tragedy can strike. Who am I kidding? Dr. Livingston said that I'd rather be in the will of God in Africa than to be in, on the throne in London. But here is what this man was able to do. When he got to Central African Republic, it says that he translated the second half of the Bible, the New Testament, and we will have John 3.16 here for you to see. Hear those words of the action that God put behind his love. John 3.16, for God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In French, we have nearly one billion people on the planet whose primary language is French. What would they hear if they hear that John 3.16? It goes, Jean chapitre 3, verset 16, « Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son Fils unique afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point, mais qu'il ait la vie éternelle. » William Haas has translated John 3.16 into my native language, Sango. It is the stetin zapa andoese se sotongaso, le mume lingeti lo nyengila ako si je sois manabena la lingbi kui pepe, mais le kina fini kila kola kwe. I was not reciting John 3.16 to impress you with my language skills, although I speak multiple languages. But I wanted you to let the word of God land on your ears how the people on the planet are supposed to know that there's a God who created this whole universe and he cares for them and died on the cross of Calvary. In this picture here is of the tomb of William Haas. It's just a, a boulder that they put over his tomb in Central African Republic. Mission, evangelical missionary Born January 4th, 1870, 
73 in Menton, Michigan, died May 28, 1924 in Bangasu. That's the name of the village and the province where I was born. So if you look at my birth certificate, it says that I was born in the, in the province where William Haas, who left the United States comfort to go make Jesus Christ known in my village, he died there. That's how the gospel got to me, at a cost. But it is said here, next to his tomb, it says that his last word, he was reciting Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And then as he was weakening, he couldn't finish it. Brothers and sisters in Christ who gave their life to Jesus Christ as a result of William Haas preaching the gospel to them, helped finish the recitation of those words. He was ushered in the presence of God. My parents are the second generation of believers saved under the work of missionaries. My father, Joseph, was a military. He's the one that insisted, Cyrus, take education seriously. People are going to ask, what are you going to do with the education? I said, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. He said, no. What kind of a person have you become as a result of your formal training? When you have money to yourself, what kind of a person have you become? You live with a sense of stewardship, not out of guilt, but out of grateful heart, Cyrus. Because of the authority of the word of God that was taught out of that Bible that William Haas has taught to the people in the village. My mother, Eugenie, has challenged all of us. I'm the oldest of 12 kids. She's the one that says, Cyrus, if you abuse any woman, you've abused me personally. If you hurt any woman, it doesn't matter the color of her skin, her country of origin. I am a mother, I am a woman, and I'm somebody else's daughter. And she was saying that because she has seven sons that she didn't want them to see women as his gain. On the authority of the word of God. How did I get here? At the age of eight, I was passionate about airplane. Born in the middle of the African continent. I didn't have shoes. A couple of my friends were making fun of me. I love watching airplane land at the international airport of Bangui, the Central African Republic. I told a friend, one day I'm going to be on a plane. He said, Cyrus, look at us. We don't have shoes. (laughs) It's only people that have money that can go on those planes. But as God would have it, this eight-year-old boy from the middle of the African continent, where some of you have gone on trips with me to Uganda, you are the father hands that many of these girls have never had. Somebody who will hold a child without molesting them in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody who was not seeing it as beneath them to play soccer, even if you didn't know how to do it, and you have those babies and you're just cuddling them and the baby falls asleep. I have a hard time often getting them on the bus to take them back to the hotel. I say, it's time for the ministry to end tonight. So no, sir. I just want this kid to be comforted while I'm here. That's what Evangel Church has done from my experience with traveling with them to see. They became the father to the fatherless, husband to the widows. And that's what this church is partnering with all these global partners to make Christ known. Perhaps another Cyrus is going to be out of those children. You would think that the death of William Haas would discourage other missionaries from considering to go to the Central African Republic. The next picture is two medical missionaries have made the decision to follow in the footstep of William Haas. Because maternal mortality rate is so bad, right now your church is supporting the birthing center in Tanzania. The next picture I want you to see after this is this baby that was born in the middle of a village, her biological mother died, hemorrhaging to death. You know what the mother's last word were? She just handed the baby to somebody and said, may God protect this child. Did you know that Joseph is an orphan whose biological mother, Rachel, she was struggling at delivering the young baby, Benjamin, that we know of. After she delivered that baby, she was dying. She named Benjamin Benoni, which means the son of my suffering. The father, Jacob, decided to change the name to Benjamin, which means the son of my strength or the son of my right hand. Maternal mortality rate is an alarming reality around the globe. In the United States, it's one in 4,800 women. You rarely hear of a mother going to a hospital and dying because we have the medical infrastructure right here. But in many parts of the world where Julie was born, one in 27 women that goes to hospital to deliver a baby will not go home alive. So when she died, May Allen was this missionary. 
Yes, she preached the gospel, but she's now in the presence of practicing the gospel. James 1.27 said, religion that is pleasing to God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their stress. She took care of this baby in the middle of the African continent. By the way, the next picture is the baby that May Allen took care of I met in 1985. That's my wife, Julie, that I end up marrying. Do you see how God's faithfulness in us obeying the word of God is for our good and for his glory? This lady that May Allen took care of many years ago as an orphan in the middle of the African continent has become my wife. And so when you're faithful in obeying the word of God, the next picture is my wife is going to be rescued because you obey. You live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quick fast forward. God has blessed Julie and I with three children. Becky, our child that you're about to see, is our oldest, 33. Michael, our son, 27. And our youngest daughter, Irene. September 2nd, 2008. I came back from work at World Health. She knocked on the door, asked permission of me to go swim. A moment later, she drowned from a swimming pool accident. Had it not been for the word of God, I would have lost my mind. Because this Bible in my hand tells me that I'm not the first father who have buried my children. And I will not be the last. Job was a godly father. One day he was minding his business. Seven sons and three daughters were killed simultaneously. He's the guy that sung, I'd said those words. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, we sing it in our song. He gives and takes away. My heart will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you realize that the lyrics of that song came from the mouth of a father who was about to have the funeral of seven sons and three daughters? But he said, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So when my daughter drowned from that swimming pool accident, I drew power from those brothers and sisters, the ancient of old, out of the word of God to say, I'm not going to lose my mind, only on the authority of the word of God. Amen. The next picture is that God has blessed the, my wife and I, the daughter May Allen, raised in the middle of the African uh, continent. She and I became grandparents. We have two grandsons, Isaac and Arthur. And let me just wrap it up with a couple of quick follow-up. The church that sent me out into Africa was struggling, almost closed its doors. I became the pastor of that church. Isn't that interesting, May Allen, in the next picture, when she raised her hand many years ago, she said, God, just use me. Ordinary people, because we were thinking of those who are missionaries, superheroes spiritually. No, that's not who God is looking for. Ordinary people who said, Lord, I'm just available to you. Do something with this life. It's not just about me. It's not just about me arriving safely at death. Do something. Use my life for your glory. That decision that May Allen has made has given me the opportunity to stand across a crowd right here at this local church to remind us when we live out the gospel. Lives that are transformed in our midst also will be transformed across the sea. I am now crisscrossing the United States and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the next picture. Proverbs 22, 6 says, you train up a child in a way that he should go. When he grows old, he will not depart from it. May Allen was in trouble. When we moved to Virginia, she had a stroke and was taken to the Lynchburg General Hospital. The doctor walked in and said, may, if you become incapacitated, who, who has the power of attorney? Who's going to make the life and death decision on you? She wiggled the other hand and pointed at my wife, the black daughter she raised many years ago in the middle of the African continent. <laughs> Only authority of the word of God. But let me share the, the, the following. May Allen died in the care of our, my wife and I, and I was the one that officiated her funeral. All her relatives have done, and we were the only family that they have when I was in Lynchburg, Virginia. I said, brothers and sisters, do you see this woman in that casket? She gave her life to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how I have a wife out of this business of obeying God. And we went to the cemetery for the committal before I lay her body to rest. I said, God, thank you for the faithfulness of this woman in that next picture. She's the one that you used to live out the gospel. It was not easy. It was painful. But you meant for me to experience that firsthand. Maybe there's another Cyrus that because of our compassion and obeying the word of God, one day they will look back and say, hey, God for evangel. I may not remember the name of the people, but his people have been faithful in their giving, in their service. And that's how I got here. It's not just my brain. There are those of us who think that, well, you know, I went to school and I pulled myself by my, my, my bootstraps. Who are we kidding? Let me conclude with these two pictures juxtaposed. 
So Proverbs 22, 6, May Allen said, you know what, Lord? James 1, 27, religion that is pleasing to God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Julie looks at the Ten Commandments that tells us to obey and, and help our parents. Julie has become the caretaker for May Allen. Isn't it not interesting? She's now leaning on the shoulders of the daughter that she raised many years ago in the middle of the African continent. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But here's what he says in John 20, 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, it is he that loves me. He that loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and will manifest myself to him. Dear brothers and sisters, I have passionately shared with you, sweaty with excitement for what God has done in my life because of the authority of the word of God. This is not just an old book. This book has arrested people out of their prides. And they've made a sacrifice for me. So you contrast what Jesus taught and the expert on the law. The expert in the law of Moses can memorize all those 600 plus laws of Moses. Brag about it. Debate it on your social platform, if you will. But it took a Samaritan who said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The legacy of that name continue to impact lives across the globe. Thank you for the privilege as a church to partner with us at World Help. Through village transformation, through short-term trips, we have gone on trips. I want people to come back from these trips gloriously messed up. To look at their lives and say, mm, mm, mm. Lord, I can go into that bathroom and turn that water on. One flush of a toilet is what the average family in Africa is using for water. And to us, that's just one flush. We go take a shower, easily 40 gallons. I want to do something with my life that will matter for your kingdom's sake. So don't just focus on your safety. Well, I have a few dollars in my life. I only pick a few people. I toss a couple of dollars here and there. Live with a sense of purpose. Evangel Church is a community of faith that exist, not about renovation of this building, but renew the people who will say, Lord Jesus, that's it. I don't want to live like this. I mean, I have what I need. This boy that didn't have shoes in the middle of the African continent now can wear some shoes. <laughs> By God's grace. So I would like to ask you to stand up. Let me pray for what God has laid on my heart as a burden. He's to remind us what is at stake when we live out the gospel of Jesus Christ? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacred responsibility that the pastoral staff has given me to share your word unashamedly and passionately to my brothers and sisters in this room who would bridge those who are watching online. I want to move out of the way, Holy Spirit, and let you arrest us to say their lives matter to you, but you want to use them as your representative, both here at home globally and also to see many lives come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's going to cost us, Lord. You paid the ultimate price on Mount Golgotha for us. Would you do the same in our hearts that we will be committed to give everything about us unto you? Father, I'm going to get in that tin can and go home today. But I hope somebody who has heard this message today will be reminded, may I belong to Evangel Church as a community of faith who is convicted to make you known here and across the planet. I pray over every person who has heard it, do what you do best, Holy Spirit. Do what you do best. Jesus alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.